honor because you are faithful and you are worthy of all praise. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your love that is immeasurable, your love that is uncontainable, your love that is unexplainable. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, you uh, loved us to the uh, point that you died for us. Lord, we are grateful for your love. We are thankful that we are in your presence. It is because of your love. I'm reminded of the scripture in Zechariah where uh, he says, he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the presence of the Lord and the accuser, Satan, standing by to accuse him. Even when we are in your presence, we understand, we know we are unworthy of you. We don't deserve to be here. But but Lord, your love for us extends forever. It encompasses uh, 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 all of our, uh, our shortcomings and uh, uh, it, it just brings us in with a warm embrace and say you are welcome uh, into the beloved. And we are grateful, oh God, that even though you knew how crazy some of us were, you still loved us. Even, even before we made our first mistake, even before we made our first misstep, even before we took as a, a step or uh, breathed our first breath, you already forgave us. You already loved us. And we are grateful for this kind of love, for what manner of love is this that a man would give his life even for his friend. We are grateful, oh God, that we're in your presence to be able to just experience the grace that you have extended to us. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you even for this moment. We give you all the glory in your name, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Welcome into the presence of the Lord. Welcome to Church Extended, uh, to everybody joining us online. We uh, thank you so much for taking time to actually come on board and spend time with us in the Word of God. For those that are joining us via Zoom, thank you so much for tuning in via Zoom. And those that are on Facebook, we are grateful that you could uh, uh, tune in at this time. Uh, please share this. Host a watch party, uh, share, uh, say something in the comments, react even as we move along with the word of God. Somebody who needs to hear this, as Nikki always says, maybe on your timeline. And uh, we, we understand that where two or three are gathered uh, uh, in the presence of the Lord, uh, the Lord is there in the midst. He promises he will be there in the midst. Yes. And even right now online, our God is online. Yes. He is an online God. He's an on-time God. Yes. Amen. Uh, 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 we give online, we worship online, we praise online because our God is an online God. Amen. 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 Uh, he's Amen. present everywhere. He's omnipresent. Uh, that means that he's present everywhere. Well, you're welcome into the presence of the Lord. And we are going to jump into Romans chapter 8. We're going to read about 11 verses of scripture, uh, starting at verse 1. Uh, of, uh, so Romans chapter 8 from verse 1 to verse 11. I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. We're going to try and move as fast as we can because we have 11 verses to cover. Uh, from verse 1, it, is, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh, the uh, uh, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Uh, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Uh, uh, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, verse 8 so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. 
But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse number 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead quicken mortal is dwelleth in you. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word because I know that the entrance of your word bringeth forth, giveth forth light. And I pray, O oh God, that as the light of your glory begins to shine ever more bright, even as we zoom into your word today, I pray, O oh God, that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened to be able to perceive the greatness that you have wrought in us, even uh, the same spirit that you raised up Christ from the dead with that dwelleth in us. I pray, O oh God, that you get the loins of our minds that we may be renewed. Uh, 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 our minds may be renewed uh, uh, even as your word transforms our minds. I pray, O oh God, Spirit of the living God, that you may speak with clarity and precisely and implicitly to the glory of your name, that at the end of the day, no flesh glories in your presence, but, O oh God, that all oh glory may return to you as we begin to come alive to the truth of your word. In your name, Jesus, I have prayed. Amen. Amen. Well, glory to God. Um, it is a tragedy to be at a table set for you and never get an opportunity to eat and never get an opportunity to taste. Many people know about uh, the truth of God's word. They have heard it from a preacher. They've read it somewhere. Uh, they've heard it in a song. They have seen it on a post on social media because they follow a bishop, a preacher, a, a motivational speaker. So they have a clue of what God's word is, but don't realize that it is a table set for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is a tragedy to uh, sit at a table set for you and never taste. Mm -hmm. It's a tragedy to sit at a table set for you and never eat. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a grave loss. Uh, 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 after the cost, all the cost that Jesus had to expend. Remember as he gives the, par uh, the story of the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, uh, 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 to say that uh, 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 he, he paid in full at the inn uh, the price that was set. But then said, if it, it is not enough, I'm willing to come back and pay whatever is balanced. So after the grave cost that Jesus had to go through, it is a tragedy for you to still be indebted to the flesh. It's a travesty for you to still be given to the flesh until and unless the word of God becomes flesh in your life. Until and unless the word of God is tangible in your life. Moving from just what's teachable to what's tangible. Yes, the preacher sounds good as his, uh, uh, with his eloquence, with his well put together words and all of that, and his thought patterns and all that, even as he's inspired by God. He sounds so good that sometimes he impresses you or she impresses you. But unless and until you take what's teachable and turn it to what's tangible, unless and until the word of God becomes flesh in your life, it is just as good as having a picture of steak never tasted. It's just as good as having a picture of a balanced diet. Do you remember in primary school, we had a picture of a balanced diet. All the things that are good for you. I know the world is advanced now with technology and science, and they're saying some of the things that were on those placards are not good for you anymore. But, uh, but you remember the picture uh, that were in our primary schools of a balanced diet. Uh, Having the word of God in your possession, uh, uh, in your uh, glove compartment, uh, uh, on your sideboard, on, uh, uh, on the bed, uh, or on the table, they're collecting dust, is like having a picture of a balanced diet, uh, never tasted. Uh, it's just like having a picture of steak. Yes, it looks succulent. Yes, it looks good. Uh, Tiani brought in lights as a, uh, as a photographer. He understands how to present products well. So he's cast a light and a bit of shadow so that you can see uh, uh, th that it's honey glazed. The, the steak is honey glazed and uh, it looks so good. And uh, uh, the environment and the lighting looks so good that you begin to salivate and uh, uh, you, 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 you feel hungry by just looking at the picture. But unless and until the word of God becomes flesh in you, it's just like that picture. It's just like a picture of steak never tasted. Uh, just like a picture of steak never eaten. Just like
like a picture from your primary school days uh, hanging on the wall, never actually uh, experienced or eaten. And I need you to tell you this real quick, that there is no nutritive value in a picture. There is no nutritive value in a picture of steak. There is no nutritive value in that balanced diet picture. You can look at it, you can study it, you can memorize it, you can recite it, you can, uh, uh, you can know by uh, commit to memory where the banana is and where, where the apple is and where the fruit basket is and where the meat is and where the milk is and all of that. But unless and until you taste, there is not going to be any nutritive value transferred to your actual body. So many people can quote scripture. Many people can commit scripture to memory, but they cannot uh, until and unless it translate, translates to the point that they are transformed by the renewing of their mind until the word becomes flesh. It's just like a picture of steak. And it is a tragedy to possess a picture of steak. For you to take the word of God as a picture. Because it is, uh, I liken it to a man sitting at a table set for them, but never ate. Sitting at a table set for you and never taste. You can recite all the verses in the Bible. The devil knows all of them anyway. You can cite all the songs by heart. Songs of worship. Committed to memory. But until and unless you surrender to becoming, can somebody say, I, can somebody say I am becoming? Until and unless you surrender to becoming who God made you to be, you will always be frustrated. You'll become a frustrated uh, 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 religious fanatic. Quoting scripture, but your life shows discrepancies of the absence of God. Uh, Paul calls that in 2 Timothy 3, and I believe it's uh, 3 and 5, that it's like having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Yes, they know the form of God. Yes, they know how God operates. Yes, they know how God heals the sick. They know how God provides for the, for the needy. They know how God answers every prayer. But yet they're crying every day. They're living a life of unanswered prayers. A life frustrated by prayers unanswered. Because often they ask amiss and they ask not knowing the will of God. Having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Uh, I'll be speaking to you. I know I got too excited for a moment. I didn't give you a title. But if you are writing notes, I'm speaking to you uh, from the subject, the law of the spirit of life. Amen. The law of the spirit of life. We're going to go into some definitions as we're doing this. What is a law? What is a law? A law is a system of rules which a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and which it may enforce by uh, the imposition of penalties. Do you understand? Uh, uh, a law is a system of rules which a particular country or community, like a community of believers, a community in a, in a, in a, in a, in a location of, uh, uh, of residence, uh, it is, uh, so it's, it's, it's a particular set of rules that were agreed upon by a country in the form of a constitution or whatever tenets that were written uh, 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 or a community rec which, recognize, which is recognized as regulating the actions the actions, not, the, not just the thoughts, the actions of its members. And it is also used to enforce okay. the imposition of penalties. You understand? That's a law. So a law is people coming together as a country, as a community, and establishing set rules that then they recognize as governing or regulating the actions of its members. Okay, and uh, uh, it enforces it enforces those rules whenever an action is uh, expended against the law. That's why you hear the word uh, uh, that is against the law. Mm. What you're doing is against the law. Mm. You are committing a crime mm. because you are going against what was uh, regulated, what was put together to uh, regulate our actions. Okay, that's law by definition. Another definition says it is something that is regarded as having a binding force or effect. Okay, something that is regarded as having a binding force or effect. 
It's like the laws of aerodynamics, the laws of gravity. Okay, uh, uh, there are different kinds of laws. So, uh, so uh, in, in, in another term, a law is something, an instrument that is regarded as having a binding force or effect. Amen. So, when we, when we, uh, going into definitions further, uh, so we say a law is a system of rules. Let me teach you a moment. The, uh, the, the, a law is a system of rules uh, uh, that uh, 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 are set particularly by a country or a com community. With just that uh, a portion of the definition, we understand that for a law to be able to be in effect, it must be able to define a jurisdiction. Mm. Okay. Because without a, a, a demarcating a jurisdiction, it is impossible to effect the law. Oh, yeah. Because that law might apply in your community, in Midrand, but it does not apply in Pretoria. That is why as you're entering into Pretoria, you see a set of cameras that are telling you you're entering into a different territory. Because there is a certain level of rules that govern each community separately. So the moment you begin to speak about a law, you must define a jurisdiction. Amen? And uh, what is a jurisdiction? It's a territory or a sphere of activity over which the legal authority of a court or other institution extends. Mm. So in order for a law to be effective, I'm teaching. In or, I think I'm teaching good. In order for a law to be effective, in order for a law to be effective, it must define a jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And a jurisdiction is a territory or a sphere or ge geographical location in some cases of activity over which a legal authority of a court or a law enforcement authority can extend. That's why you see, uh, I remember we used to feed in Hillbro. Um, during winter, we would provide a food in Hillbro. Uh, 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 our C CXK is going to bring that, uh, bring that back on. Uh, we would go out every winter and would give out blankets, would give out food twice or thrice during the winter season. And for us to be able to do that, we needed uh, to actually be on the right side of the law to do that, not disturbing the peace. So what we would do is we would drive our cars, 10 to 12 cars, to Hillbro Police Station because they are placed in this area to actually uh, e effect and uh, uh, institute or make sure that the laws that regulate or govern the territory of Hillbro are put in place. And if you want protection, you need to be on the right side of the law. We would go there and we would pick the captain of the station and some police officers that would tag along with us. So that whenever anybody would see us, they would know we are on the right side of the law. Yeah. We've got police escort. But I remember one time we gave so much in Hillbrook, in every corner of where the homeless were, until we were done and we still had stuff with us, foodstuffs and blankets. And we began to drive towards uh, the main tax rank uh, in Johannesburg. As we were driving there, we go to a certain place where they stopped us at, at that big park. I think it's uh, uh, Jobert Park. And they said, uh, Pastor, um, this thing we're doing is noble. We love it. We want to continue. But we have reached the end of our jurisdiction. We cannot cross over this jurisdiction. We're in the same city, but this is where our territory ends. So for a law to be effective, you have to be within the territory or sphere of activity that is defined as your jurisdiction. So we had to call for the home, go collecting the homeless to bring them to the park so we could help them. Sure. Amen. So um, uh, when, when we continue to define the definition further, so we understand that there has to be a jurisdiction, there has to be a community, there has to be a country, there has to be a group of members, people committing together, agreeing to a certain level of principles that they, uh, 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 a particular level of principles that they, they, they define as uh, governing or regulating them regulating their actions, regulating how they operate. And we understand that they may define in those laws that if you break this law, we enforce it this way. We're able to punish you this way. And there are penalties involved. Mm. 
And the moment you bring in penalties, you're speaking to the imposition uh, uh, of a sentencing or consequence resultant to apprehension. So they catch you and they try you and they admit you as guilty and uh, they, uh, 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 then they sentence you. So, uh, so the penalty part is also defined uh, uh, and prescribed within the tenets of this law. We're speaking about the law of the spirit of life. Amen. Now let's, let's jump into the scriptures. Um, uh, verse 1 of Romans 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation. All right? I understand that you feel sometimes inferior. Even your own mind condemns you sometimes. It tells you you're not good enough. It tells you you're not well educated enough. You, d you didn't finish school. Uh, you didn't have a good background. Your parents were poor. You were born in Zimbabwe of all countries. It's listed last in, uh, in the list of countries. Or you grew up in uh, Zingi Zingi and, uh, and, and all of that. And you condemn yourself or in Malamlele or or in Tula Mahash, and you condemn yourself because of your background, because of what you're socialized around. You see your peers moving ahead, your peers doing things seemingly moving ahead in life, and you condemn yourself. And also the accuser of the brethren, the devil, continually planting thoughts, trying to accuse you, saying you are, you remember what you did last year, you remember what you did yesterday, you remember what you did when you were young, you remember the sin of your father, you remember uh, that there was a great grandmother who cares this family because your great grandfather did this to the family and there is so much information that is against you when you look at the legal systems or uh, the, the the economic systems uh, of the world even though we are a majority in Africa they often don't even favor us you feel condemned when you go to the bank and you're trying to get that loan and you're trying to sort out your life and they reject you you're trying to uh, start a business they say they, they are no jobs so start a business you try to start a business and you put it out on social platforms nobody is noticing it nobody is, uh, is, is liking or sharing and you feel condemned by so many things happening around you. And often, when you are re refusing op opportunity, it feels like you're being condemned. Yeah. But scripture says there is therefore now no condemnation. We're going to understand what, what this means. There is therefore now no condemnation. It means now, right now, in this moment, as you're hearing the word of the Lord today, and you're responding to the word of the Lord today, there is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. Nobody, nothing condemns you right this moment. Now, let us look at the word condemnation uh, uh, in the context of scripture here. Uh, it is the Greek word katakrima. Katakrima. Uh, 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 that is an adverse sentence. An adverse sentence or verdict. There is no longer a sentence. So it means in, this, in the context of the scripture, you were qualified as one uh, 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 befitting a sentence. You were qualified as one who committed the offense. One who was unworthy of forgiveness. And so there was an adverse sentence or a verdict, guilty verdict, set against you. This means that the guilty verdict, uh, now when scripture now says there is therefore now no condemnation, it means that the guilty verdict... The sentence, the adverse sentence that was given you has been redacted. It has been re reversed. It has been stricken from the records. And that uh, uh, the defendant has been released from custody. Must be released from custody. Okay. The moment you read the scripture, there is therefore now no condemnation. It means the demons that used to lay hold of you must release you now. It means that uh, the inferiority complex that has uh, plagued your life, everywhere you go, you just feel like you don't measure up, must leave now. Nothing has a hold on me now. I wish somebody would say that. Nothing has a hold on me now. Now, now, so it says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. You remember what I said when I started? It, it is a tragedy to sit at a table set for you and never eat. Uh, it's a tragedy to sit at a table set for you and never taste. It's like having a picture of steak and there is no nutritive value in a picture of steak. You can read the scripture until you are black and blue. You can read the scripture out loud, shout it out on the top of the mountain until you lose your voice. But unless until you understand that it's only no condemnation, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. 
If you, if you give yourself permission to underline your Bible, you would underline the word in. Because that is the key word in the scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation to them, to everyone who is in Christ. It's one thing to say, Jesus, come into my heart. But it's another thing to be in Christ. Because there are many people who say, Jesus, come into my heart. But then they, they, Jesus came and swept over the whole house. Kicked out the devils. And uh, because you did not cultivate a response of becoming whatsoever God has called you to become, you begin to collect dust again. And the Bible says when an evil spirit leaves a body, it goes to all kinds of places seeking rest and finding none. And it will say, let me go back to my old house and see about its affairs. And when it shows up and it finds no one staying there, it will go back and invite other seven other deadlier ones so that they can come have a part in you. And the Bible says in the, book, in the book of Hebrews, the end of that man is worse than his beginning. Mm -hmm. So the key word is in Christ. So what are the signs that you are in Christ? It continues to say, uh, uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Signs to show, a sign to show that you are in Christ is not walking after the flesh. If you're still walking after the flesh, you're not in Christ. It's clear. What is to walk after? It's to chase something. Violently, to a violent end. You're chasing it. That's all you're living for. You're pursuing it. You're driven by the flesh. If you're still driven by the flesh, still pursuing the flesh, you're not in Christ. He says, but they walk after the Spirit. My father taught me this when I was young. He wanted me to be a lawyer. I wish I'd listened. Um, he taught me this. He said, son, anytime you say but, you nullify everything you said before. That, that word. The moment you say but, whatever you're about to say, supersedes what you just said. It says, who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Verse number two says, uh, shows us how to be in Christ. Right? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life inside Christ. Not around Christ. When I was pondering on this, I remember Judas. Judas had the privilege of being so witnessed to by the Savior himself. The Savior came for him and said, I need you to follow me. Himself in person. And Judas said, yes, I will follow you. He walked with the master. He knew the color of his eyes. He knew the color of his hair. The complexion of his skin. He could differentiate him from Peter. Distinguish him from Peter. He knew the smell of his breath. He knew the phonetic sound of his voice. If Jesus called amongst the twelve, he knew it was Jesus calling because he knew even the phonetic sound of his voice. His accent. He knew he could smell his scent. He could reach out and touch him physically. But yet, he was not in Christ. It's easy to walk with, to walk around, talk about. We talk about talking about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. If we keep talking about Jesus, he will show up. It's possible to talk around and talk about and not be in. So it says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made you free. I wish you could celebrate God's freedom right there. <laughs> it has made me free from what? From the law of sin and death. It just defines it. There are two laws at work at any given time. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus versus the law of sin and death. If you are not within the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, you are within the jurisdiction of the law of sin and death. There are no gray areas. 
There is no fencing. There's no, I, I, I want to come in, but I can't. For, for a double-minded person is unstable in all of his ways. He will always achieve nothing. So there is no great. You can't be observing both. Mm. I'm checking out both. I'm just testing. I'm just checking to see where I will, you know, get a better deal. I was listening to a comedian the other day and he was saying, um, um, uh, some city, uh, uh, they, they named the city that uh, it, it, it is just like heaven. And he went to that city and explored that city and he found himself thinking if heaven is like this i might have to look take a second look at, at hell <laughs> just to check it might be better there is no fencing in god there is no fencing it's either you're in the light or in darkness uh -huh. amen uh, in verse number three we're now defining uh, the jurisdiction explaining the jurisdiction for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin to the flesh. <clears throat> when I read the scripture, I got confused. For a moment, I'm like, Lord, I don't, I don't know what Paul's trying to say here. I'm really lost. And the moment I began to say that to, to the Lord, I felt like God began to speak to me and said, son, remember we just defined by Google. And by the way, we defined what a law is by Google. But now we also define what a jurisdiction is. But now I'm showing you that principle at work. Jesus could not condemn or bring to an end or sentence or pass a verdict or nullify or even make void the law of sin and death without the ability to die. Did you catch that? Jesus could not condemn the, the law of sin and death. He could not render void the law of sin and, uh, 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 and death. He could not pass a verdict or sentence it or relegate it to uh, uh, being cast into the lake of fire without the ability to die. For you to be able to affect this law, you have to be within its jurisdiction. Because that would have, because if he had uh, 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 condemned the law of sin sin and death while in the heavens in his heavenly body it would have caused what we call a jurisdictional conundrum it's impossible for you to bring about uh, an end to the law of sin and death without the ability to be in sinful flesh and the ability to die so god is defining the jurisdiction for him to be able to condemn sin in the flesh he had to occupy a fleshly body he could not condemn it without entering into a fleshly body. How did he condemn it? Yet without sin, he became sin. So he was in a sinful body, but committed no sin. Condemned it in its territory. Overcame it in its jurisdiction. So Jesus then, uh, we see that he condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, And uh, uh, when you read it clearly, it says... For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Right? God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not just in the likeness of sinful flesh, and also for sin. He sent him also for sin. When he says he sent him for sin, he was not sending him to commit sin. He put a hit list together and said, sin is on that list death is on that list satan is on that list demons are on that list but i need you to go son for sin not to sin for sin for the sake of okay and then conde he condemned sin in the flesh all right now remember we said uh, there is therefore now no condemnation is catacrima in the Greek. Now when it says here, and he condemned sin in the flesh, it's a different um, uh, phrase altogether. It's a, di it's a different word altogether. It's related though, it's katakrimo, which is an adverse sentence or the verdict to, uh, 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 making a verdict to stick. Okay? Uh, so he had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh so that he was able to make the, uh, the condemnation stick on sin. Okay, and uh, 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 he condemned sin in the flesh, uh, which is to, to judge against. He judged against sin while in the flesh. 
Okay? For he, 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 he hath made him to be seen or, or for us who knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness yes. of the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. He made him to be seen for us. Even though he knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. Listen, Jesus conquered sin and death in its territory. He conquered disease in his territory. That's why he was able to walk past a man with the sickness of the palsy. And he was able to heal him. He was able to tell ten lepers, go show yourselves to the priests. According to the laws of Moses. And as they went, they were cleansed. He was able to uh, put spittle on a man's eyes. Defy the law of blindness. In its territory. He was able to co conquer sin and death. The law of sin and death in its territory. That's why when they come and say, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because they were thinking and operating from the jurisdiction of the law of sin and death. And he continually defied it. He defied lameness. He defied uh, a maimness. He defied a sin. He defied a blindness. He defied uh, a disease. He defied uh, 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 even death. All in their domain. In their territory. In the place of in, in their place of influence, yes. where they rule and reign, mm. he conquered them in their territory. That's our jurisdiction. Verse number four. Why did he do all this that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us? <coughs> Who walk not after the flesh? So the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those who do not walk after the flesh. Can't claim the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God and you are gra salivating and gravitating towards the flesh every day. Everything about you is about chasing the flesh. I'm, I'm asking you a question. Every day you wake up in the morning to go to work and uh, run around and do everything you do. Why do you do it? If you do it just to feed the belly, if you do it just to put a roof over your head, something is wrong with you because you are just pursuing the flesh. But if you do everything you do to the end that you may be a faithful steward of God's work, your own work, your own purpose that God has called you for, yeah. so that you can function in the kingdom, mm. then that's a different story. Mm. So, the, uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Jesus had uh, uh, to come through 40 and 2 generations. Uh, become sin and even though he knew no sin he, he, it means he had no fellowship with sin he had no entertainment yeah. center for sin he had no playlist somewhere a YouTube playlist somewhere where he would just check some stuff when nobody's watching he had no behind closed doors uh, syndromes where he shows a certain lifestyle when nobody's watching and when everybody's on him he, 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 he's showing himself a different, a, a different way uh, he went through all the way, leaving no room for a technical dismissal. To the end of that, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Remember when Jesus got, uh, was resurrected from the dead? I didn't want to touch on this, but uh, the Lord is leading me this way. Jesus, when he resurrects from the dead and he's in the garden, Mary Magdalene comes running to the garden. When she doesn't find him in the tomb, she walks up uh, out into the garden and she sees him. And she thinks he's the gardener. He's the undertaker, the guy that uh, deals with um, uh, renovating and keeping the graves in shape. And he asks, where have you, where have you laid him, where, where is he? And, and, and when, when she hears his voice and she recognizes him, she wants to touch him. He says, don't touch me, because I haven't gone to the Father yet. I used to wonder, why did Jesus say, don't touch me? And God revealed it to me, because um, uh, in the book of Hebrews, it, it shows us that there is a tabernacle in heaven. That is a, 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 the exact mirror reflection of what God showed Moses to build in the wilderness. Mm. So there's a tabernacle in heaven and Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself mm. and went, say, I have to first, see, I have to first go up like a high priest and sacrifice, put this lamb on the altar so that the Lord can consume it. You understand? For the atonement of sin. I have to take it up. And what's crazy is that he is ascending. He has not yet seen the Father. He's ascending into the tabernacle of God, 
carrying himself. He is ascending as high priest and he is ascending also as the lamb. He is walking into the court of the tabernacle of heaven as a high priest carrying a lamb, but he is carrying himself. If you check, it was not eight days before he showed up again. You know why? Because in the book of Exodus, around 33 I believe, it shows how a high priest is anointed. How you appoint an anointed high priest. Take seven days. He would not leave room even for a technical difficulty, a technical dismissal. He had to fulfill the fullness of the law. That's why he says to John, I must fulfill all righteousness. But I, I have to do it. I can't leave anything to chance. I won't let you touch me because a high priest before he went into the tabernacle annually, he was not allowed to be around a woman because a woman might be on a menstrual cycle. She's unclean. You understand? So Jesus could not leave any room for a technical dismissal. That when she wanted to embrace him, says, don't touch me yet. But immediately when he shows up when they're in the room with Thomas doubting, he immediately goes to Thomas and says, touch me. Immediately. It's okay now. It's over now. So he, he went through all of this, became sin for us, put on flesh, counted it not robbery. Though he was equal with God, became flesh. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God. What is, what, what, what's the evidence of this? What's the evidence of this? It is The evidence of this is a people who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let's go to verse 5. We're almost done. Um, how can you tell you are in the flesh? It's a teaching today. How can you tell you're in the flesh? I'm almost done. Trust me, I'm almost done. How can you tell you're in the flesh? By minding the things of the flesh. It says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. I had to do some deep study on this, deep dive into this. The word, the, the word do mind, the, the phrase do mind is translated into the Greek word phronio, uh, which is to entertain the flesh. Those who entertain the flesh. Those who have a sentiment for the flesh. I want to say, but I don't really like just my personality. So those who mind the things of the flesh, those who have an opinion or, or, or are they are mentally disposed to, uh, uh, to, 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 to be more earnestly toward a, a uh, fleshly desire. For they that are after the flesh do mind, they desire, they live for, they work for, they invest for, they build for, they organize around the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. Woo That's amazing. They that are after the Spirit, they seek first the things of God. They seek first the kingdom of God. They seek first the kingdom world. It means for everything, a job, a business, like Adventure was teaching us last Sunday, whether it's a business, whether it's an investment, whether it's a, it's a relationship for marriage, whether, whether it's a friendship, covenant friendships, whatever it is that you do, you seek to do it the kingdom way. Before you do it, you check what does the word say about this? What, has God's, what is God's law concerning this? The laws of the spirit of life in Christ. Verse number six says, for to be carnally minded is death. I wish you could say that. To be carnally minded, to be carnally minded. is death. Is death. Mm, how do you see that you're carnally minded? Your relationships are dead. Finances are dead. Your desire for the things of the spirit is dead. Your lifestyle is dead. Your attitude is dead. Your outlook of life is dead. Your future is dead. Why? Because the law of the flesh is the law of sin 
and death. So when you are carnally minded, you are governed by the law of sin and death. When you are pursuing the flesh, you are regulated by the law of sin and death. So pursuing the flesh, the law of the flesh is actually the law of sin and death. And we know Romans 6 and 23 uh, says for the wages of sin is death. So if you are driven by the flesh, you are driven by the law of sin. And often nine, 10 out of 10 times, every time you pursue the flesh, sin lies waiting on and John, First John uh, 3 and 4 says, And whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law. Which law? The law of sin and death. Mm. For sin is the transgression of the law. So to be carnally minded is a death sentence. Mm. I need you to know, if you are gravitating, salivating around fleshly things, you are on death row. Mm. Yeah. Just waiting to die. Yeah. You are already in a death zone. You are in the congregation. We must relegate you to the jurisdiction or what the word of God calls the congregation of the dead. All right? Then continue to say, but. Remember what I told you my dad told me? The one say, but you must nullify everything you said. It means what you're about to say supersedes what you just said. It says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit. But they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. When we look at your life, when you look at your, uh, your, your, your lifestyle, when we look at uh, where you're going, with, when we look at your choices, can we see evidence of the things of the spirit? When we look at how you love your wife and how you respond to your husband and how, and, and, and how you conduct business, can we see evidence of the things of the spirit? Or we just see your flesh hogging the whole space. Uh, but the spirit, uh, uh, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Amen. That's now verse number, verse number, we're in verse number six. Uh, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm, to be spiritually minded, to uh, to gravitate towards, to pursue, to desire, to live for, to organize around, to invest in, to uh, converse around, to build around uh, uh, the things of the kingdom, the things of the spirit, is life and peace. And in the Greek, it's Zoe and uh, uh, Irane, uh, which is life and prosperity. You want prosperity? You want life? John 10 and 10, and 10 uh, for the thief cometh forth to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I came that they might have, that you might have life and have it even more abundantly. This does not just speak to spiritual things, it speaks to all things. Amen. And uh, verse number 7, let's go to verse number 7. Because the kind of mind is enmity against God. The kind of mind. The fleshly mind, your hippocampus, your oblongato, is enmity against God. The, 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 the minding of the flesh, the things of the flesh, desiring, building around, conversing around, co converging around, congregating around, uh, uh, investing around, and uh, uh, living for the carnal things is enmity, makes makes you makes it an enemy against god this means that you are cutting you it cuts you off from the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life in christ when you are carnally minded you cut yourself off from the law of the spirit of life that is found in christ so carnality then uh, is a ticket out of the out uh, a ticket or an exit out of the commonwealth of god the moment you start thinking about your capabilities your abilities your surroundings your connections how to get out of situations on your own outside of god when god has prescribed a way a kingdom way kicks you out of the commonwealth 
of God because you are now trusting in chariots and horses. You are now trusting in your own ingenuity and uh, in your own inventions and uh, 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 your own abilities. And so uh, it, it becomes an exit card, uh, a one-way ticket uh, outside of the commonwealth of God. So carnal-mindedness is, uh, uh, as we continue to read in verse number 7, says for, t- for, for carnal-mindedness is not subject to the law of God. What does that mean? So it's not subject to the law of God, uh, uh, which is the law of the spirit of life and uh, uh, in Christ. Uh, and in, in neither indeed can be. What does that mean? It means that carnal mindedness is not subject, uh, or rather uh, does not obey God. Anytime you think your own way, when God has his way around approaching a problem, a situation, a, 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 an activity, anytime you uh, take uh, your thought and make it uh, 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 preeminent over God's word, God's thought, God's will, God's plan, you are in disobedience. So carnal mindedness is, cannot be subject to God because it's not within the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Because the moment you're carnally minded, you have brought yourself or relegated yourself to the jurisdiction of the law of the flesh, which is the law of sin and death. Verse number 8 says this. I'm trying to cruise now. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, sometimes the word of God uses language that might not be easy for us to understand as Africans. Please, God, is it making him happy? What is it saying? Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Does it mean cannot make God happy? No, they are in disagreement. They that are in the flesh are saying we are against God. We disagree with God. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. I disagree. I've given you the power of life and death. I disagree. I can do all things through Christ. I disagree. To be carnally minded is to, is to uh, 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 disobey God because a carnal mindedness cannot be subjected or subject to God. Um, in verse, number, verse number nine. Uh, verse number nine now defines what is our jurisdictional position. Yes, num- uh, number nine, verse number nine says, but ye are not in the flesh. Remember the word but? Mm-hmm. Once you say the word but, it supersedes everything else you've said. But you, I am not in the flesh. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Let's wait that quickly. Uh, you are not of the flesh. You are in, in Christ. You're not in the flesh. You are in, Christ, uh, uh, in the spirit. And uh, uh, it continues to say, only if the spirit of God dwells in you. Okay. Do you catch that? Mm-hmm. It's possible to know it. It's like a picture of steak. Never taste it. There's no nutritive value in a picture of steak. Talking about him doesn't help. He, you have to be in him in order for you to experience him. In order for you to be uh, affected or acceptable within the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life and death. It says, if you, uh, it says you are not of the flesh but in the spirit if the if factor is there. If so, be that the spirit of God dwells in you. And if so, be that the spirit of God does not dwell in you, you are in the flesh. And therefore subject to the law of sin and death. Amen. Number two, if you do not have the spirit of Christ, you are none of his. Did you see that? Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, still in verse 9, he is none of his. I don't care how many scriptures you caught. I don't care how many Bibles you own. The Amplified, the TPT now, 
the uh, Living Bible, the, uh, the Kingdom Version, the New Kingdom Version, the ESV, the Tonga one, the Shona one. <laughs> doesn't matter, doesn't matter how many concordances you have. Matthew Henry's commentary of the Bible, Thompson Chain reference. Doesn't matter how deep, how a deep dive you may do into studying theology and become a doctor of doctors and all of it doesn't matter how many caps you wear unless and until you are in Christ unless and until you are in the spirit unless and until the spirit of God dwells in you you are none of his that means you are un, 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 unaccountable within the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life in Christ. That means that you are not a citizen. John 1 and 12. To the, uh, uh, whosoever uh, 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 believed in him, he gave them power to become the sons of God. It, becomes, it means before we believed, we were not sons. We were not accepted in the beloved. We were not part of the jurisdiction of the law of the spirit of life. In Christ but when we said Jesus come into our heart and when a man is in Christ behold watch him what you you can you nobody has to tell you nobody has to preach about it when a man is in Christ you see it you see that the laws that they're operating up under they are the laws of the spirit of life in Christ because they walk into a place where there is sickness and sickness disappears because right within that jurisdiction, Hallelujah. we're operating from a higher jurisdiction. Amen. I'm going, going ahead of myself. Verse number 10. I'm, I see I'm done. It says, and if, the if factor is there again, and if Christ be in you, if Christ is in you, if, it means that it might not be. If Christ be in you, the body is dead. What? Here am I. I'm in Christ. And you can see my body. Perhaps because you're not in Christ. If Christ be in you, the body is dead. Wait a minute. So I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. So It's one tier to be in Christ. It's another for him to be in me. And if Christ is in me, it means my body is dead. Hmm? The body is dead. Uh, the, the word dead there, uh, it, 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 it renders um, into corpse. If Christ is in me, my body is just like a corpse. Okay. I've heard preachers say, oh, no, the body is never saved. I, I get that, I get that. And the body will still do what it what wants. It will still gravitate toward, towards what it wants. But I'm saved, you know, I'm, I'm already okay. I'm, I'm, I'm accepted and beloved. But the body will still do what it wants to do. But the word is saying, if a man is in Christ, the body is dead. It means that its desires are dead. The things I used to gravitate towards are dead. The only reason why they're not dead is because I'm like tippy-toeing. I'm in the grave. Then he says, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Because the body is subject to the law of sin and death. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So if Christ be in you, the body is a corpse because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. I wish you could tell somebody, fear the walking dead. Because mm, we have too many people walking and they're dead. And you, you see, you see, your life was moving at a certain trajectory until you got into a relationship with them. And suddenly you're stalling. They're so, they, I heard a preacher once say that there are people who are so dead that even if they touch the remote in your, in your house, the batteries die. They are so dead that uh, they, they are so dead that if you enter into a business relationship, the business dies. If you enter into a marriage, it dies. If you enter into any kind of agreement, whatever they touch just dies. Fear the walking dead. Verse number 11. I'm done. But if the spirit of him, if, you see, if again. But if the spirit of him, the two words that are interchanging, if, in, if, in, 
You see that? But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, if the spirit of him who? Of God. Who raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you? Question, does he dwell in you tonight? Today? Is he, are you sure? Are you sure you've made room? I want to I, I, I do something dangerous. Jonathan McReynolds says, I will make room for you. I will prepare for two so you don't feel like you can't leave you. There is a problem with that. Because if I prepare for two, then there are two bulls in the house. Myself and yourself. So what if I don't like what you're doing? What if, what if I don't like what you're talking about? What if I don't like where you're sending me? I, I don't need to prepare for two. I need to, I, I need to die. So you can live here alone. Yeah. Drive this alone. But if it's two, it's two minds. Do you see that? And I often say, many people say, Jesus, come into my heart. But you have to walk all the way past the living room, see my big speakers of the stuff I listen to when nobody's watching and things I watch when nobody... You can see all my stuff, but walk all the way to the back room. And we say, Jesus, come into my heart, but don't touch my stuff. He says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, I want to shock you, shall also, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in you. Okay? When I read this, I, listen, since I was a baby, I had the scripture. Okay? If my daddy was here, he would probably say, Chokwadi son, come on. Fabanaro, come on, come on. Because I'm in his teff now. I'm in his territory now. So I grew up with this thing. And, uh, and uh, uh, I've shared on this thing. Okay, I've preached on this thing. I've preached on this thing. I've prayed this thing. I've meditated on this thing. But I did not see what I saw this past night. If the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you. That's a condition. Every law defines condition. In order for you to fit into this jurisdiction, you must have the spirit of him that raised up Jesus Christ. You must not only have it, it must dwell in you. It means there's a relationship. It's not paying rent. You, it, it doesn't have a lease. It cannot be kicked out. It is permanently dwelling. It's not visiting. It's not coming on Sunday. It's not coming on Wednesday. It stays here. It lives here. It is not quenched. Quench not the Holy Spirit. It is not speaking and you are ignoring it. It is not speaking and you're turning its volume down and say you're disturbing me. I just want to have a party. I just want to have a ball. I just want to go my own way. It is alive in you. It is a speaking spirit. It is directing you. It is showing you the way and and you are following wheresoever it leads you so that you don't frustrate the grace of God. You don't frustrate the spirit that you have received. If those conditions are met, then you fit into the jurisdiction. It then means that he that raised up Christ from the dead shall, not may, or can. It's guaranteed that if you fit into this prescription of the law of the spirit of life, that the spirit of him, of God, who raised up Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. If that fits, it means then, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your spiritual body. Is this talking about resurrection? The resurrection of the dead? When Jesus shall come back to earth again, Oh, our Lord will come back to earth again. And those uh, that died in Christ shall resurrect first. And we shall all see. And uh, uh, we, we together with them, we shall be transformed. And this corruption will put on incorruption. And uh, we will be changed by the twinkling of an eye. And we will be caught up together with him uh, to meet him in the heavenly places. Is it talking about that? Is it talking about that? Is it talking about incorruption? Is it talking about when this corruption is put on in corruption it says the spirit of he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal not immortal your mortal bodies that word quicken means to make alive so shall make alive your mortal body do you remember when jesus is in you the body is dead it's a corpse 
but the spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, if it dwells in you, it will make your mortal body alive by a spirit that dwells in you. Such that what would be impossible in the flesh is now possible because of the law of your spirit of life in Christ which you are now operating up under. Do you understand? Do you understand? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Do you understand? If the spirit of he that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, you're able to lay hands on the sick. Something that is unlawful in within the jurisdiction of the law of, of, of sin and death. Because when a man is sick, they're relegated to die. But you walk up in there and say, you may see me as I'm in the flesh, but Christ is in me now. I am in Christ and the spirit that raised them up from the dead has also is also in me. Uh, I, I didn't want to go here, but I'll go to Ephesians chapter 1 uh, in closing verse 18 to 20. Uh, I, I won't paraphrase the whole thing. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 18 to 20 says, the eyes of your understanding must be enlightened that you, you may know what is the hope of his, of his calling, not your calling, and what uh, what, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe to us who become to us who come alive to the truth of his word according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought which he performed which he worked through which he brought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named doesn't matter what name you can name uh, the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead is above it doesn't matter what you're going through doesn't matter what you're facing the spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead has has power to quicken your mortal body. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, it will quicken your mortal body. It puts you in a place where you are now, you now have within this earth access to the law of the spirit of life in Christ. You are within your rights. You are within your jurisdiction. You are able to walk past the sick and cast the sickness out in the name of Jesus. Lay hands on the sick and they're healed. Speak a thing and it comes to pass. Agree. Two of you, two of you agree. It's touching anything and it happens. Because of the law that is now at work in you. This then means that the law of sin and death is rendered dead. When you are in Christ, you're able to walk into the places that used to intimidate you and say, wait a minute, I'm a new creation. I'm operating up under a different law. I know that there's somebody here who has heard the word of God before. Somebody here who might have said yes to Jesus, but had not understood that you need to be in Christ. And you have been plagued by the laws of sin and death and you've been living your life on the edge every day trying to make ends meet trying to come out of oppression trying to come out from the things that have challenged you the things that intimidate you uh, trying to lay aside the weight of the sin that easily besets you and you are tired and you don't want this word to be theory I personally don't want this word to be theory. I don't want to carry this kind of word as a picture in my pocket that I never ate, that I never tasted. Because there's no nutritive value in that. There's no transformation in that. There's no change in that. I don't want to walk about knowing all this. I don't want to walk about after having had this and still walk back into the arms of an unbeliever, into the arm of flesh. I don't want to relegate my life to the jurisdiction of this, uh, the law of sin and death. If you are like me and you're like that, this afternoon you're saying, you know what? I want to come back home. I want to be within the jurisdiction 
of the law are the spirit of life in Christ. I need to bow your, bow your head, close your eyes where you are. This is not a religious thing. This is for to, to avoid any distractions. I know you're at home. You've got children around. You've got family around. You've got roommates and you've got friends or, or you've got other things um, around you that may, may uh, catch your attention. I just need you to close your eyes for a moment. Bow your heads and lift your hands and surrender wherever you are. Lifting hands is a sign of surrender. I know, this is not religious. This is a sign of surrender. You're surrendering right now. Father, I pray for everyone who's surrendering right now. Everyone who's giving, they're committing their life to you. That you beckon them to come. Come out of hiding. Come out of the shadows. Come out of the inferiority complex. Come out of uh, 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 the downtroddenness, the heartbreak, uh, the sin that easily besets them. I pray, O oh God, that you woo them, you, uh, you cause them to come to your river, O oh Lord. You cause them to come to you, O oh God. In your name, Jesus. I'd like everybody that is uh, saying yes to this to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I understand the cost of the cross, the price. I understand now that you're calling me to growth. You're calling me to a life beyond my own. You're calling me to live your life. You're calling me to operate in your spirit. And Lord, I let go of every distraction, of the fear of the flesh, of the sin of the flesh, of the associations that continue to pull me backward. And I surrender to you now and declare that Lord Jesus, you are Lord over my life. You are Lord in my life. And you rule and you reign and you govern and you regulate all of me to the glory of your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.